and welcome back. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeff Tarrant. Dr. Tarrant is a licensed psychologist and board certified in neurofeedback. He is the director of the Neuromeditation Institute, or NMI, and author of the book Meditation Interventions to Rewire the Brain. That sounds great. His research focuses on exploring brainwave changes that occur as a result of contemplative practices, technological interventions, and national and international, uh, oh, excuse, and altered states of consciousness. He is a regular presenter at national and international conferences <laughs> and has a private practice in Eugene, Oregon, uh, where he specializes in technology-assisted meditation. Uh, for more information, you can visit Jeff at drjefftarrant.com and neuromeditationinstitute.com. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Jeff Tarrant. Okay, I'm not used to using a mic like this. How's that? Can you hear me okay? Does that work out? All right. So uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, really what I'm talking about today is some citizen research of looking at what's going on in the brain with microdosing psilocybin. Um, so I'm going to kind of um, give a little basics. You know, with this group, I probably don't have to do a hell of a lot of introduction about psilocybin or microdosing. Uh, However, I will, just in case. Uh, and then I really want to get into the material because there's a lot to cover in 30 minutes. By the way, I realize that the, it's a little hard to see some of the slides. If you are interested, you can contact me after this, and I will be happy to send you a PDF of the slide deck if you want to check that out on your own, So, just so you know. Okay, so just kind of a basic orientation for those of you that might not be familiar with microdosing. Uh, you know, the idea is that you are taking a... Uh, very low dose of a psychedelic, so sub-threshold, so that you're not getting into a full psychedelic state. In fact, you, you, the way that most people are using it is that you would barely notice that something's happening. So a very, very small amount. Usually this is done with LSD or psilocybin. Um, you know, so you're talking about 1 20th to 1 10th of what might be considered a, a normal recreational dose, I say in air quotes, because obviously that's a that could be a big range, depending on the person and depending on the medicine. Um, so we're talking, you know, between 6 and 25 micrograms of LSD or between 0.1 and 0.5 grams of dried mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. So, uh, you know, you'll see things like, so James Fadiman has done a lot of work in this area and, and published a lot. And, you know, talks about scheduling this in a way where maybe you're microdosing every third day, something like that. And this is a common way to use um, microdosing. And I should say that people are doing every different kind of scheduling you could imagine, including every day. I know people that microdose every single day, and they've done it for years, which is maybe a little overkill. But, hey, whatever. Um, and then people who will microdose just periodically, whenever it sort of feels right, you know, like sort of intuitively, like, oh, I could use a little assistance. So th there's all kinds of different schedules. Now, what's interesting is that microdosing has been getting a lot of attention lately, but there's virtually zero research. Like, literally, there's nothing. Uh, the stuff that's published is all anecdotal, uh, for the most part, um, with a few exceptions. So, um, it's going to be hard to see this slide a little bit, but... Uh, so, this was from a presentation at um, Beyond Psychedelics from a conference, and um, the authors, uh, I believe the, the guy's name's Anderson... Yeah, that's correct. And basically what they did was surveyed a bunch of people through social media and read it. Basically, like, just said, hey, anybody who's ever microdosed, fill out this survey. We're curious what your experience has been. And, you know, the little pie charts here are basically showing both the, the, the positives and sort of some of the drawbacks that people report um, from microdosing. And so you can see, you know, in the first pie chart, it's more of the benefits. So, you know, creativity, improved focus and energy, improved mood and outlook. So that's pretty consistent with, you know, when you talk to people or you read more anecdotal reports, that's what people say. Why do you microdose? Oh, it, you know, it gives me a little boost of energy. I, it improves my mood. Um, it helps with creativity. And you hear a lot of people talking about using it for depression and things like that. 
the drawbacks, uh, the biggest chunk of the drawbacks is the fact that it's illegal. <laughs> and so, you, you know, worrying about supply and, and you know, the sourcing and, and these kinds of things. Um, you know, not being able to talk about it openly with other people, like those kinds of things were the biggest drawbacks. However, people also reported things like physical discomfort, anxiety and overstimulation, and cognitive interference as things that can be problematic. My experience in talking with people who microdose regularly is that those things do come up, and it's usually if you take a little bit too much of a microdose. There's, there's a fine line. <laughs> there's a fine line. And so, you know, if you take a little bit too much, sometimes people will feel a little bit agitated or, um, you know, some physical discomfort or, you know, have some cognitive interference. Um, so this is kind of, you know, this is what we know, right, as far as sort of survey research. Now, Anderson and his group, they, they did a follow-up um, where what they did was they used um, questionnaires. So rather than just kind of asking people, hey, what, you know, what, what was this like for you? They used... Uh, established questionnaires and gave them to a group of people who have microdosed, uh, who are microdosing, and then to people non-microdosers. And sort of just gave them these questionnaires to say, is there any difference between these two groups of people, people who microdose and people that don't? And what they found was that there were some significant differences on a few of the scales. One was on mood uh, in terms of valence. So people who microdose reported generally having a better mood. <laughs> um, they also had lower dysfunctional attitudes. They had higher scores on wisdom, lower scores on negative emotionality, and uh, higher scores on open-mindedness. So that all sounds pretty good. Uh, and again, this is very consistent with what people report, right? So it's not a big shock. This is it. This is the only published, this one's published. This came out this year in a, in a um, refereed journal. It's the only publication that I'm aware of on microdosing. That's it. Um, and there's nothing looking at the brain. So, you know, we, we're all pretty comfortable by now that there's a lot of research looking at the brain on full doses of psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, you know, Robin Carhart Harris and his group at the Imperial College, they've done some amazing work. That's all great. Nobody's looking at microdosing. Well, they are, but it hasn't been published yet. So we don't know anything. Uh, so what we did was I was approached by a group of individuals who said, you know, we want to check this out. Um, will you map our brains if, if, if we, if we want to do this? And I was like, sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> and so, uh, we started this with three subjects. So obviously it's more of a case study, but you got to start somewhere, right? We, we know nothing. So the, the scenario was that these three individuals, uh, came in on separate occasions uh, it was about the same time in the morning that they came in. We did a baseline of a, a mood questionnaire and a baseline of a 19-channel EEG recording. So we put a little cap on their head. We can measure basically the entire brain electrical activity at baseline, just them sitting there doing nothing. Uh, they took their microdose. These were all people who knew each other, so they, they agreed, and they, they each took the exact same size of microdose. It was 0.25 uh, grams of psilocybin. It was from the same source. So we at least tried to control a few things in this. So it was the same amount, same source. It was about the same time in the morning. Uh, after they took it, they just sat there and read a book for 45 minutes. We tried to control what they were doing <laughs> so that it wasn't just, you know, kind of going out and kind of stirring up other things in the brain. They sat there and read for 45 minutes. And then we did a, a, a second measurement. So how's your mood now? Fill out the same questionnaire, measure your brain again. What happened? So there shouldn't have been, we know that the brain is actually pretty stable. It, it doesn't, if you don't do something big to it, your brainwave patterns look pretty much the same. So you really have to do something in order to shift the brain significantly. And in this case, there wasn't really anything else that happened. They just sat and read a book, which really shouldn't be enough to change things. So I want to walk you through each of the three subjects briefly, and then I want to kind of put it all together at the end. So this was subject one. It's going to be a little bit hard to see here, but we've got the brain waves starting with the slowest brain waves down in the end, delta, and then moving up to the fastest brain waves. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, the brain makes all kinds of different electricity, fast electricity, slow electricity, uh, everything in between, and we're making it all, all the time. So that's what these different terms refer to. Delta is a very slow wave. Theta is a little faster. Alpha is a little faster. 
up to gamma, which is pretty much the fastest frequency that we measure at the moment. And that's usually around 40 hertz. So 40 cycles per second. So what we did, the analyses that you're looking up here, up here these little brain maps, uh, is basically a comparison between the pre and post for this subject. So we took the data from the beginning and we took the data from the end and compared them and said, what was different? Now, if the brain looks green, that means there basically wasn't any change. When the colors start getting down into the blues, that means there was a decrease of activity, a significant decrease. When it starts getting up into the reds and the whites, that means there was a significant increase of activity. So you can see the little bar at the bottom in between, that's kind of showing you. So if it's in the middle, then that's the green, it means that nothing really shifted. So when we look at, at this brainwave activity for subject one, you can see that most of the heads are green. Most of them didn't really do much, except delta and theta. The slowest brain waves both dropped pretty significantly. So you're decreasing all the slow brain wave activity. Now, if I knew nothing else, and I'm just looking at this and I say, hmm, if you take away a bunch of slow brain wave activity, how are you gonna feel? You're gonna feel more alert. <laughs> if you take away slow brain waves, it's activating. You know, if you add a bunch of slow brain waves, it's going to make you, you know, tired. It's going to make you kind of like fatigued or, you know, daydreamy or something like that. So dropping out a bunch of the delta and theta, that's not a big shock. That kind of makes sense. So let's look a little bit at what, what the self-report was of how the session felt. Um, wow, you can't see that at all. Um, so these are different uh, mood scales that they took before and after. And I can tell you the short story. Basically, it's exactly what you would suspect. Most of the, the negative mood things went down, um, although they weren't that high to begin with. So, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of room for them to move. And the positive ones tended to go up. So, you know, not a big shock, nothing really surprising there. Now, I had each person um, shoot me an email later in the day. Usually it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon was when I tended to get these emails. So the day had kind of gone by, and it was like just a reflection, like, hey, how was your day? and just their own words, no criteria, just kind of like, you just fill me in. And this is what this person said, or at least some of the uh, blurbs. And I'm gonna kind of get down here so I can read it a little bit more clearly to you. That's not gonna work. <laughs> Microphone's up here. I think I can do this. Here, how about glasses? Uh, uh, it was enjoyable, uh, slight boost of energy, stronger attention paid to body posture, centered and stable, slightly quicker and more efficient thought patterns noticed an enhanced sense of courage, a desire to interact with others in a more collaborative fashion, ability to step out of my comfort zone and achieve greater success in goals previously set. Jumping down, overall slightly increased appreciation of the day's accomplishments. And then talking about empathy. So I, I highlighted a few of the key words that seemed important. So enjoyable, energy, courage, collaborative, appreciation, empathy, sounds pretty good. And again, you can see a little bit of that if you think about decreasing the slow brainwave activity, that activation, right? And so, you know, he talks about energy in the very first line. So it makes sense. So we're seeing that there's at least some connection that makes some logical sense between this. Okay, fine. Now, my interest in doing this in the first place was, gee, I wonder if this medicine does the same thing for everybody. That was kind of the idea, right? It's like, does it do the same thing? Is there something reliable that we can say about this? So... Let's look at the second person. Okay, here's subject two. Huh, doesn't quite look the same. So remember, it was basically the exact same time of the morning, same dose, same source. Um, now this person, look at the delta, instead of it decreasing, it actually increased. And it increased on the right hemisphere only. Okay, interesting. Uh, now, then you look at theta and alpha and beta and high beta and actually into gamma, and you see that blue up in the front. That's up in the frontal lobe. So there's a, a pretty significant decrease of all of those brainwave activities, but it's isolated to the frontal lobe. Interesting. And then in gamma, the fastest one, you also see, it's a little hard to see on this image, but there is a increase in the back right portion. So I took a second image, which you can't really see, but this is isolating that occipital lobe because basically I had to kind of rotate the 3D head image so you could see the back a little bit better. And when I did that, it's all white, which is, that's the, that's the furthest on the extreme of increase, the white is. 
So huge increase of gamma in the back of the head. Now for me, that was particularly interesting because gamma is the fastest brain wave and it's associated with things like being in a flow state, like understanding high level concepts in a very non-efforting kind of way. You know, when you just get something like insight and you're not really working for it, it just happens automatically, that's gamma. And so it's happening in the back of the head, which is interesting because that's our visual processing, right? And so at first you'd be like, okay, are they seeing better? Um, but what I've noticed is that it's not just vision with your eyeballs. It's literally how you see things, like how you see the world um, is also here in the back of the head. So very interesting, right? You got this gamma, this huge burst of gamma in the back of the head. And then also the frontal lobe is kind of like becoming less active, which is interesting. If you think about that, the frontal lobe, this is our executive functioning, right? This is what the thing that's always trying to control, <laughs> control everything. And that kind of dropped out. And then at the same time, you've got this. So kind of an interesting combo. Now this person, again, same kind of thing. Scale looked about what you'd expect. You know, the, the negative e e mood scores went down a little bit. The positive ones went up just a little bit. And this is what the person said about their session. Today, I was able to listen to my intuitive inner voice and in decision making. My ability to slow down and take care before responding was stronger. Being out in public was somewhat uncomfortable. I was most at ease when I got home at four, enjoyed my family time with a little more lightheartedness than usual. So again, interesting, think about it. Um, so the first thing they said was this in, listening to this intuitive inner voice. So again, to me, that might connect to that brainwave pattern. Well, if you get the frontal lobe out of the way, that's trying to run the show, that logical, linear, verbal way of processing information. If you quiet that sucker down, and then this becomes active, doesn't that make sense that that might be a little bit more of that intuitive kind of inner voice that you're able to kind of connect with? Kind of cool. Okay, and pretty different than subject one, which is, it's like, huh, okay, that's interesting. So let's look at subject three. Uh-huh, okay, all right, great. So, yeah, so, you know, if you're a researcher and you got this, you're going, oh, brother, okay, what a... What did I get myself into here? You know, so this person, uh, there's no blue at all. Um, it's all either green or red. So there's increased activity and it kind of is moving around. So there's increased Delta, but especially in the front on the left, alpha is increased in the back of the head. You got, and then you got beta, high beta and gamma all ramping up in the left frontal area. Totally different pattern than what we've seen with everybody else. What in the world is going on? So then when I looked at the more specific data, I really kind of latched onto that alpha because it was one of the biggest increases. Again, you can't really see it, but I was looking at this strip down the middle called the cingulate gyrus. There's a strip of brain matter that runs right down the middle that connects the cortex, the outer layer of your brain to your limbic system. So it's literally the bridge between your thinking and your feeling brains. So that's what the cingulate does. It modulates between your thinking and your feeling. Yes, yeah, the cingulate gyrus. Yeah, sometimes called the cingulate cortex. And so this was where we were getting a big boost of alpha. Now alpha is an interesting brainwave because it's more of an internal awareness. It's like you're relaxed, you're quiet, and you're more kind of, it's more of an inner awareness. So again, I'm thinking about this like, okay, there's this big increase of alpha where on the strip that's kind of connecting your emotions and your feelings. Okay. So how might that play out? Uh, again, we can't really see much on here, but the one thing I'll point out on, it was, it was mostly the same as everybody else's decrease in negative stuff, increase in positive stuff with one exception, the confusion scale started at a zero and ended up at a four. Mm hmm. So you remember those, those things that people said, some of the drawbacks, right? You can get some kind of cognitive issues, right? So, you know, we don't know, we're speculating, but maybe the dose was just a little bit too much for this person, right? And it was kind of like, ooh, okay. Uh, may have made, you know, some aspects of thinking difficult. This is what they said. They had a lot to say. We kind of edited it just a little bit. So a very mildly altered perceptual thresholds. So again, that suggests maybe the dose was a little bit high. Remember, 
a typical microdose, you're, you're trying not to get to that point. Um, so it's like maybe we went just, you know, maybe it was a little bit much for this person. Uh, experienced, in, uh, experienced lapse in planning and strategy. Uh-huh. Yep, that makes sense. Um, overall feelings of muted gratitude toward life itself. Uh, today was effortless for the namaste factor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I want to start a daily or even three days regimen of this. <laughs> uh, I did notice a heightened tendency for physical clumsiness. Uh, time and again, I became aware of physical action seeming to take too long and be too complicated. I caught myself talking to myself throughout the day, which is not something I normally do. So again, it's that internal, right? And guess what? If you're internal, do you think you're going to be more physically clumsy? Yeah, because you're not paying attention to the external environment the same way you normally do. So it's interesting, right? You can kind of see how this plays out from what's going on in the brain compared to uh, what their reports are. Now, I made this slide to kind of line them all up so you could see them on top of each other because, um, you know, you get to this point and you go like, okay, now what do I say? Because everybody's brain did something totally different, like literally totally different. And so um, I thought that was actually very important just to kind of point out because what it suggests is that there's a lot of individual variability people aren't going to respond the same way. And this is one issue I've had with other um, brain imaging research with psychedelics, is that they're taking these large groups of people, or semi-large groups, and looking at the data and saying like, overall, this is what we're seeing, but it doesn't account for any individual variability. Is everybody's brain doing the exact same thing on psychedelics? I don't think so. Uh, I doubt it very much. In fact, I don't even think the same person's brain is doing the same thing on psychedelics one experience to another. Those of you who have done psychedelics, I'm sure there's a few of you uh, in here, um, you know that you know, two experiences you know, two weeks apart could be totally different, completely opposite, even if you took the same dose of the same thing. So why would the brain do the exact same thing? Doesn't make any sense. So, but this, I think this is important to consider. So this was kind of going to be the end of my talk. Uh, it was like, okay, individual variability. All right, cool. And then I woke up yesterday morning with a new idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, you know, I'm one of these guys that likes to have my stuff done like weeks in advance, you know. And so waking up yesterday and going like, oh, my God, I have to look at this. So I spent all day reworking the data um, instead of doing what I was supposed to be doing. And... Um, <laughs> And so I want to share with you this other way of looking at it that actually becomes very interesting in relation to this, as if it wasn't already interesting. So what we looked at was uh, looking at z-scores of change. So if you're not familiar with z-scores, um, I've got a little bell curve up here that, you know, when you measure anything in the environment, uh, most people are going to fall somewhere in the middle. So you measure intelligence. Most people are going to score somewhere around 100. It's right in the middle. Right? Some people are going to score 140. They're an outlier. They're way at the end. They're way at the tail end. Some people are going to score 50. They're way at the end. Most people are going to score in the middle, and then it kind of trails out. Well, it's the same with brain waves. You can measure somebody's brain waves and compare it to the rest of the population. And we expect people's brain waves to kind of behave more or less in the middle somewhere. And then when you see a lot of things that become outliers, that might be important, because that means the brain is not behaving normally. It's behaving in a different way than we would expect, okay? So I had this crazy idea. I said, gee, I wonder, even though it's doing something different in everybody's brain, I wonder, just by chance, if it is actually normalizing the brain and everybody's brain's different, so it's going to look different. So this was the approach I took. So I ran everybody's EEG data before and after against a normative database. So there's lots of databases that exist of EEG. So I can say, well, how does your brain compare to, to average? Not that we want anybody to have an average brain. We definitely don't want that. But how does it compare to average? And so what I end up getting are these Excel spreadsheets with 40 different brain regions going down one side. And across the top, I've got 14 different EEG bands, seven for the left hemisphere, seven for the right hemisphere. So you can do the math, whatever it is, 560-something possible variables. And so for each one, I get a z-score. How different is that exact measurement from average? So basically what I did was I said, okay, 
I'm going to run this data and I'm going to look at these Excel sheets and figure out how many scores were at least two standard deviations above or below average. Two standard deviations is usually considered significant. It's like the 95th percentile, right? So I just counted them. So you can see them highlighted in red. This is an example. So I counted all of them before. I counted all of them afterwards. Said, how many scores are outliers? Okay, does this make sense? Okay, good. And, Again, a little bit hard to see. Subject one, subject two, subject three. This is the pre and post number of outlier scores. And what you can see is now, all of a sudden, guess what? Everybody's brain did the same thing. Their brains normalized. Everybody's brains became, had fewer outliers after taking the microdose. So in the first case, thank you. In the first case, uh, the number of outliers decreased by 70... 74%. And the, for the second person, it was 37%. And the last person, it was 71%. Decrease of outliers. Very interesting. So now, this is only three subjects. But to me, this starts to suggest that it's like, huh, interesting. You know, there's that new data coming out showing that psilocybin increases production of, uh, it increases growth of uh, your brain cells. You guys have seen that, right, or heard about that. Uh, there is, there's some evidence that psilocybin increases brain cell growth. So it's interesting because it's like even looking at a microdose, it's moving the brain more toward a balanced way of operating, which makes it more efficient. It's like very interesting. So to me, this is very, um, uh, gives us a lot of room for working in the future. Here's just an example comparing the pre to post. Uh, for one person, you can see that it got much more normal in the second round. Um, and so wanting to really kind of think about how we might use this information. A, we need to study it more. Um, you know, we need to first examine, you know, a larger population. Does this happen consistently or did I just get lucky and kind of find this with these three subjects? Um, what happens over the course of the day? Instead of just doing pre-post, what happens if we measure them 30 minutes after, an hour, three hours, five hours the next day? What is the progression of changes in the brainwave activity? Things like this. And then for me, what becomes really interesting is what do you do while you are in this heightened state of balance? So, you know, people like Tom might have some opinions about what you might be able to do while you're microdosing, but being very intentional with that state. And I think there's a talk later today about that as well. So to me, it makes sense. Wouldn't you want to take advantage of your brain being in a more efficient, flexible balanced state to put into your brain at that point exactly what you're trying to develop for yourself. I'm just spitballing here, but um, uh, so I know I'm out of time and some of you may have questions. So um, uh, we don't have time for questions, right? No. So uh, here's the thing. Catch me, you know, out here or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, I'm only going to be here for a few hours today. My information is on the very front table when you walk in the door. There's a brochure and a, a card for me. I'm happy to talk to you, um, you know, through email or on the phone or out in the tent or whatever. Can you clarify for this study, was this using synthetic psilocybin or was it using psilocybin? This was using psilocybin mushrooms. Yes. All right, thank you guys. Keep it going for Dr. Jeff Tarrant. That was awesome. That was great. Thank you so much.